Welcome back with South Africa's unemployment rate at nearly 27%. Chances are you or someone you know is looking for work. Is small business the answer to getting our country back to work? Now that looks like the case because small to medium enterprises make up 91% of formal businesses. So how do we make them flourish and create jobs? And will South Africa's position in BRICS help? To answer these questions tonight, we have the Minister of Small Business Development, Lindiwe Zulu. And remember, you can send us your tweets or phone us here in the studio because we will be taking your questions. A very warm welcome, Mr. Zulu. Thank Let's start off with BRICS. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back. Yeah. Is BRICS going to be good for business? Yes, it's going to be good for South African business in the long term. Um, it's 10 years now that we've been uh, building this foundation and we think that uh, going forward it's going to be the next best thing both at a political level in terms of the five BRIC countries which make such quite a big population of the world and therefore the opportunities are big there but the first 10 years really to be frank it was just the creation of a very good base from where we can leapfrog uh, into the future learning from each other, um, sharing our own experiences, looking at the good uh, practices and good things that are happening between us. But of course there is a challenge. Each one of us have got our own national interests that needs to be fulfilled. And therefore, at the end of the day, it's national interests, but it's the opportunities that present themselves for all these uh, five countries coming together. And what sort of clout, especially focusing on small businesses, what sort of clout does South Africa have amongst the other BRICS members? What sort of leverage does South Africa have when it comes to negotiations? Yes, remember that we were part and parcel of starting this. If we go back a little bit in history, remember that there was IPSA, which was India, Brazil, and South Africa, and then it grew up uh, into BRICS. So because we've been at the very beginning and we are committed to the very thinking of why you needed to put together these five countries and the reason why we thought for developing countries to come together and to challenge also issues from a political level to deal with our social challenges but also to look at the economic opportunities that exist and I think that we have an opportunity as a country and I know that many have said to us that we are uh, 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 we are a small country in comparison to the rest of the countries, but that's where we want to be. We want to be known, we want to be seen, we want it to be understood that globally we think that we've got a role to play to contribute towards building a greater world and a greater society. And but we are the only country on the continent. We are the only, Rick. So yes. I guess from that point of view, yeah. that's pretty important. That gives us a bit of clout. But the good thing about us is because as a, as a country, we're not only looking at ourselves as South Africa, we're also looking at our role in the African continent. You will see that uh, in BRICS uh, at the moment, President Cyril Ramaphosa has invited uh, most of the SADC uh, heads of state because SADC is now looking, because BRICS is now looking at who else can be in partnership with us in terms of creating this new world that we're trying to, trying to create. Besides the, the African, the SADC member states, we've also got some other African heads of state. We've got Uganda coming, we've got uh, Rwanda coming, we've got Senegal coming, so we've got quite a number. So you can see that there is a movement here. It started very small, but it is a movement that's looking at how can we create something that resonates better to all of us. Okay, I want to focus now on how small businesses are likely to benefit from BRICS being hosted here. How small businesses need to be uh, looked at, invested in more in this country to make them reach the potential that they can. How do we do that? It's been a, a struggle to actually get the topic of small and medium enterprises to be high on the agenda. Why? Well, I guess because every time people think about uh, development, people think about economy, think, people think about development, they look at the bigger picture of things. Yeah. They think about big projects, and when we look at the projects within BRICS, even if you talk about the BRICS Bank, when you talk about the BRICS Bank, they're not thinking that small and medium enterprises will have an opportunity to knock onto the doors of the BRICS Bank. Here we are. 
We've knocked on the doors, and BRICS is open to small and medium enterprises. This morning, for instance, we had a roundtable discussion where the Department of Small Business Development brought a local uh, South African small and medium enterprises organized formation with the Brazilians, with the Chinese, with the Indians. We're all in one room and saying, yes, we've all got our national interests, but we've got a beautiful platform that exists that can be opened up to small and medium enterprises. Okay, what We've got invest, investments. Okay. Who's going to be investing? It so can't be big investments only. No. We've got to also look at small and medium enterprises. Okay, so they are important. They play a role. Opening up well, the market. What is your advice to them? What do my they advice, need to do My to advice, first and foremost, is that South Africans, because being a South African, mine is to make our own South African businesses to be aware that there is a train that is moving. And that train is not going to be waiting for you if you're going to be sitting somewhere and waiting for somebody to come and tell you about it. It is here. You've got to take the opportunity, find out what is BRICS, what has it got, what's the market, what's open, what's possible. Our responsibility as government is to create a conducive environment. We can't do the business for them, but we can create a conducive environment. And have you, by, have by you opening. been investing in small businesses? Absolutely. Have you been giving them the opportunities? Absolutely. The fact that I'm talking about the, the, the roundtable discussion that we had this morning, and it's not the first, it's the third roundtable discussion that we're having this morning. Remember, BRICS is 10 years, mm -hmm. but the small and medium enterprises is only the third roundtable that we're having because, again, over and over, we have to keep on reminding everybody the importance of small and medium enterprises. And fortunately for us, if you go to India, if you go to Brazil, if you go to Russia, if you go to China, you will find that small and medium enterprises are very important, but they're also supported by their governments. So we would like to say to them, what is it that we can learn from each other? But it's beyond learning. It's about can you open up the opportunities? Um, last year, we took a, a, a delegation of uh, a small and medium enterprises to China, for instance. And there were women who are women in the, in the, in, in the wine industry. They came, ba came back already with uh, uh, orders from China. The issue is they're saying they don't think they can be able to make the order because the order is quite huge. It's China, it's India, it's Brazil, and it's, and it's uh, 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 India. What can we be able to sell to them? We know that they sell a lot to us, yeah. and we know that we sell a lot of our raw material. We want to reverse that and make sure that as they bring goods that have value add into South Africa, we want to take our own goods that are value add to the BRICS countries. Cello from Clerkstorp has called in. Cello, go ahead. What's your question? Yes, madam. My question is the following. Uh, the minister, like all other uh, ministers and business people, are always talking about funding for small businesses, but we have never seen it forthcoming. There are all sorts of uh, uh, institutions by, or that have been introduced by government which are supposed, are supposed to be funding small businesses, but we see nothing happening in that front. What is the minister of comment? He might have not seen nothing happening. I will tell him of cooperatives that have been funded by my Department of Small Business Development, some of which are very successful. He might have not seen anything, but I will tell him of many small and medium enterprises who have received funding from the department. Here's the bottom line. It's, the demand is huge. The demand is not impossible but it is possible for us, but it's impossible to, for us to have covered everybody within the four years of being in government, firstly. Secondly, we will continue to encourage people to look for funding, look for opportunities, okay. not only from government. They need, yes. We need to expand it. How so do they, they access those funds? I mean, it seems like such an enormous task, isn't it? If you're starting small and you just want to get a little grant, I mean, where do you go? You go to your local structures first and foremost because I think there's a there's a problem here where everybody wants to go to the national government right everybody wants to go to the Minister of Small Business Development people must try and find out what does the province have as the finance institutions and I know that 
all provinces have got their own provincial financial institutions. What do the local structures have? Before you even go to national, what do the nearest form of government have for you? And I know many have been supported in all provinces. Many have been supported. Not enough. I cannot deny the fact that not enough have been covered. And part of the reason why not enough has been covered is because since the department started, suddenly there's more and more people who are waking up to the reality that they don't necessarily have to be going out and looking for jobs from government or anybody else. They can be able to start their own businesses. It's four and a half years that we have been in place. We've assisted as far as we possibly can. I can say we haven't reached everybody, but when I look at the people that I meet and discuss with, and when I see young women, uh, small enterprises that are youth-owned, that are women-owned, that are slowly getting up there and being supported, there's also the private sector. Okay. We are engaging with the private sector to say to the private sector, let's work together now. Okay. Don't monopolize everything. Can, can I catch on to you a bit about, about yes. women starting up in business? And I've got, I've got a, a woman here. She lives in Johannesburg. She's got a job. She's a single mother of three, and she wants to own her own business. A member of my team reached out to her today. So let's just listen to what she had to say, please. I work in the beauty industry. I've been working for nine years and my speciality is laser hair removal. And I use the laser machine to do that treatment. And one day I wish to own one of these machines. However, the capital to start or the money that I need to buy that machine is half a million. That's what the machine costs. What I would like to know is that is there any hope for a person like me who is passionate about what she does and one day wish to open her own business? And I know I can make that money back because this is so popular when it comes to the beauty industry. And I am so passionate about what I do. And I would like to know if there's any hope for a person like me one day to have her own business. Thank you so much. Mr. So how would you answer Nandiva? I need to take the details so that I can be able to get in touch with her. The office can get in touch with her. You know what I like about her? She says, I know I can make that money back. Yeah. So she's not sitting there and thinking somebody's just going to come and give the, her the money without having to return the money. My department has got soft loans, which are uh, less than the expensive loans that people get. And we also give a longer period of time for a person to give back the money. I'd like to have her details, and then we can be able to call her and find out what we can do, because there's options that she has. Yeah. She can either apply for a soft loan or she can apply for an incentive in the department because we've got a uh, what we call national informal upliftment strategy where we give a particular amount and we don't want that amount back because we know that some of them is very difficult for them to return the money back. CIFA in the main would like to have the money back because we've got to cover quite a number of people. So at the end of the show, I'd, I wouldn't mind I would, I would getting the details because this is what I do. Great. When I find people like this, I call, I engage, I send them to the department, I ask them if, whether they're getting the support they're getting or not. If they're not getting support, I push my department to make sure that they get the support. Well, that's good to hear. Can that's, I bring in Tabo from yes. Rodeport? Tabo's yes. on the line with, her, with yeah. a question for you. Go ahead, Tabo. Evening, uh, evening, Minister. Tabo speaking here. Um, Minister, would you consider to open a Tumamina department or a division within your department just to protect the SMMEs that are not being paid within 30 days within the government department because that kills the SMMEs. Thank you. Thank you, Tabo. Gladly. This is one of the biggest challenges that we have. And the unfortunate part of it is that it's not the department that's not paying. I can tell you right now, all our, uh, re, uh, 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 we pay up on 30 days, we are on good record with that. That's why the challenge for me is the other departments. What do we do with the other departments? And when he says, can we have a Tumamina on that? We already have the Tumamina, and it sits in the office of the monitoring and evaluation. Because monitoring and evaluation is the department that can be able to name and shame departments that are not paying on time. And also we have included in the performance of the DGs, part of what has been in included now is the accounting officers 
payment of the, within 30 days is part of the, 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 what is expected of them. And if they don't pay within that, that, that 30 days of too many companies, action must be taken uh, 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 against them. Right. I know that um, uh, the 30 day payment is, a, is really is a nightmare. And we bring small businesses down, can't abs you? Absolutely. That's, that's our belief that when they don't get paid within 30 days, it really breaks their, their department, I mean, breaks their business because they don't have the bigger pockets of money of trying to patch here and there. As government, we've taken serious considerations of what needs to be done. As I said, the department, we have also pushed for it as a department of small business development to say that all departments must pay within the 30 days and there must be consequences for those who are not paying good. within 30 days. Well, that's good to hear. I believe that's a good way to go. Let's talk a little bit about zoning. We know it's a challenge for businesses in residential areas and this business owner, it's a family member of somebody from my team here at ENCA, has this question for you. Good evening, Minister. My name is Shivani Chengan and I am 36 years of age. I am a mother of two. It has always been my dream to open up a car wash for women, by women, with a nail bar, coffee bar, kiddies play area, etc. This business idea was created when I witnessed the rise in prostitution, drug and gang related issues in the Chatsworth area. I see this as a way to empower women in the area. However, I have a problem with the municipal land that is available yet to be adopted or beautified but not to lease or to start a business. Minister, can you clarify if the land belonging to the municipality can be used for business purposes? And if so, how can I go about making the arrangement? Thank you. Yes, uh, municipal areas have a, a part of what we are looking at as a department. Not long ago, actually, I was by one of the taxi ranks and I saw this huge uh, plot and I asked, what, who does it belong to because there's an old dilapidated house in there and I was told that it belongs to Telcom. And I was like, okay, let me get to Telcom because I believe that that piece of land shouldn't be staying the way it is. And it's next to a taxi rank. So for me, when I see the women who are selling at the taxi rank, all squashed and all difficulty, and I see that piece of land next to them. I think that the city of Eteguini has to do something about it. Same that here. Change in planning? Would you need a, a change in how do what zoning planning? What is it? I mean, what's the? Well, most of it doesn't really need that much of zoning. It's the regulations that sits, sits with the local structure. That's one of the reasons why, as a department, we believe we need to have a coordinated approach to supporting SMMEs because legislation regulation is passed at that local level and then people are calling us as a department to say we see this piece of land but that piece of land belongs uh, to the local structure hence our demand that your local economic development offices must be given better power than what they have right now people are going to go to them they must be given the necessary resources they must have the necessary human resources so that such questions shouldn't be asked to me as a minister of small business development those questions should be answered by the local economic development uh, structure, but also those are questions that must be answered by the province. And so when, since we started as a department, we've come to realize that as a government, we are one government. We can't be three or four government. We're one government, so we need to find a way of coordinating amongst ourselves so that the answers must be at the local level. Because for her to wait for us at national level is going to take forever, whereas the demarcation, for instance, can be answered by the local structure, whether there was demarcation or not. And again, with her, it will be a question of, can I have a conversation with her so that I can be able to understand the challenge way better than sitting in Pretoria at national office, moving around, yes, of course, but the people that need to give us the answer are sitting right there with her at local level. Okay, sitting on a plane at the moment, which has just landed, I believe the door has just opened, is the Chinese Premier. Xi Jinping coming to South Africa yes. for that BRICS conference. It'll be very interesting to hear what sort of contribution he's got to make towards the BRICS conference as well as the other leaders, including those from Africa. But it's, uh, it's been wonderful having you on the show with us. The plane pleasure. has landed at the Vartkloof Air Force Base. Minister Zulu, thank you. My pleasure. Next, with Robert Mugabe gone, did the corruption leave with him tonight? The answer looks like a no. When we come back, we'll head live to Harare.